Bart here, and today I'm going to make you a battery genius. Well, maybe that's an exaggeration, but I'm going to at least share some information with you that you can use to impress your friends, if they're battery dorks like me. Otherwise, hopefully it's just useful information. But today I'm going to talk about how lead-acid batteries specifically really work. And I started looking into battery technology in terms of its practical aspects uh, back in high school, actually when the internet was still fairly new. And unfortunately today, if you do a search on deep cycle batteries or whatever you want to search for, you pretty well get the same information. And it's not correct. So today I'm going to try to explain why that information is incorrect. Some of the very basic concepts of batteries that is on the internet and incorrect is putting batteries in parallel. When you see people making a battery bank, and I did this on an earlier video, um, basically just to keep things simple, but when you see people making a battery bank, if they have four 100 amp hour batteries, they'll say, I have a 400 amp hour battery bank, and it's four times as good as having one battery. That's not really the way it works, and uh, if you watched my previous video, I demonstrated that. In this video, I'll explain why that is. Secondly, the capacity of a battery does not depend on how quickly you discharge it. It also doesn't depend on how quickly you charge it. And that goes directly against much of what you read on the internet, including in battery data sheets. Those data sheets are not incorrect, they're just used and interpreted incorrectly. Another very common piece of misinformation that you'll get is that battery capacity is reduced at low temperatures. Your battery has the same capacity when it's cold as when it's hot. And a simple thought experiment, which I'll cover a little bit later, shows that it's illogical to say that it has a different capacity cold than warm. In my previous video, titled Parallel Batteries Don't Add Up When 1 plus 1 equals 2.7, I demonstrated with real batteries that if you put two batteries in parallel, they last quite a bit longer than each battery separately would. But I didn't really explain why that is, and this video is going to explain that. I also demonstrated that if you take a battery and discharge it at a high rate, you can continue discharging it at progressively lower and lower rates and still get the full capacity out of the battery. Now, specifically what I want to talk about today is something called Pukert's Law. And if you've been using batteries for a while, you're probably very familiar with this concept. It's all over the internet, and it came about uh, over a hundred years ago from a scientist, a German scientist named uh, Pukert. I honestly don't know his first name. It doesn't really matter. But this guy realized that Batteries are really complicated, and there really aren't any good models, even today, to really understand how a battery works and all of its complications. The basic chemistry is fairly simple, and I'm going to cover that here briefly, but they're just complicated beasts, and even today, the models that exist, computer models and such, they are specifically tailored for that application. There is no general model that's, that's correct. Uh, so. This guy, back then, when there weren't computers available, he uh, went through some empirical testing with battery technology of the time. And he demonstrated that if you discharge a battery very quickly, you don't get a lot of useful capacity out of it. If you take that same battery and you discharge it very slowly, you get far more useful energy out of that battery. And this has a lot of practical implications. Electric cars were just, uh, were just, were just coming onto the scene at that time. But it's been misinterpreted over the years, and today I don't think there's a good understanding of how to actually use Pukert's law. Now there's an equation for this, you can look that up, I won't cover the actual equation. I'm just going to cover the ideas behind it. And I'm going to say that essentially Pukert's law is incorrect, and I'll show you why, but I do want to qualify that by saying this is a very intelligent and thorough scientist, he did a very good job, and his data set is useful. It's just not really used correctly today. So let me first show you, in general, with a very basic chemistry, how a lead acid battery works. As I stated, the basic chemistry of a lead acid battery is fairly simple. And I took chemistry in high school, so I think I'm qualified to explain this. So what is a battery in its very basic form? Well, it's a big bucket of acid with some lead in it. So let's draw a big bucket of acid. There's a bunch of acid, and we have some lead over here, 
that sticks out the top and some lead over here that sticks out the top. And we're just going to call this one positive and this one negative. And then there's some acid in here. Now, in a real battery, these are very carefully calibrated parameters. The concentration, molality of the acid, how much lead is in here, the surface preparation of the lead, how they're physically arranged, all of these things that have to be very carefully calibrated to get a useful battery. The battery I'm drawing here, you might as well just use a potato, because this would be useless. But at least the chemistry is still the same. So you have the electrolyte. What is the electrolyte? It is water, H2O, and you put in some sulfuric acid. Which happens to be H2SO4. And as soon as you put sulfuric acid into water, it disassociates. So this never really exists. This will break down almost immediately into a couple of positively charged hydrogen ions and a negatively charged SO4 ion. So now you have a very high conductivity solution here. The conductivity in this electrolyte is very, very high. That means there's very little resistance in this electrolyte. And the conduction, if it matters to anybody, is by ion transfer in here. The pluses move, the minuses move, and that's how you get your conduction. In any case, this positive electrode is not actually made of lead. It's made of lead dioxide. And the negative terminal is just made of ordinary soft porous lead. So, how does this thing actually store electricity? Well, if you just stick these things in here, what immediately happens is that these ions react with the surfaces of these two electrodes. And when you charge them, you force the reaction one direction. When you discharge them, you force the reaction in the opposite direction. So let's just assume that this battery is fully charged. A fully charged battery is going to have lead dioxide over here and lead over here. There won't be any lead sulfate in this battery except for parasitic occurrences of lead sulfate. And the battery should never have any significant amount of lead in the electrolyte. Now what immediately happens in this battery once you disconnect these terminals from a charger is it starts to discharge. And what it does when it discharges is this lead over here reacts with the SO4 ions so you end up with lead sulfate on this terminal, but this is negatively charged. And you end up with two electrons in the negative terminal every time this reacts. And now you have lead sulfate on this terminal. Every molecule of lead sulfate that forms, you get two electrons in this negative electrode. The positive one, on the other hand, this lead dioxide reacts with the hydrogen ions. And every time a hydrogen ion reacts with this, you get essentially a positive charge over here. And the positive charge happens because those ions uh, are stolen, basically. These pluses react with the lead dioxide. It steals two electrons and deposits them in a layer of sulfate on the positive terminal. And this is now left with not enough electrons. Eventually, this whole thing reaches equilibrium because there's no current flow, you don't have these terminals connected. This whole system reaches equilibrium and you're left with a whole bunch of negative charge in your negative terminal and no electrons in this one, or at least fewer. And it essentially becomes positively charged. Now when you complete the circuit, negative to positive, to start your car or whatnot, some of these electrons migrate their way across into the positive terminal. So these are taken away, they go into the positive terminal, and now the reaction can continue once again. More of this sulfuric acid gets used up, and when it does, it becomes more and more dilute. And you end up with almost pure water by the time the, the reaction has gone to completion and your battery is dead. And it also causes a whole bunch of that sulfate to grow on the sides of both the positive and the negative electrodes in your battery. And when you recharge this, you shove the current in the opposite direction. The electrons flow this way 
and these reactions get reversed. The sulfate breaks up, it goes back into acid in your battery, and your battery is recharged. So this is the very basics of how a battery works. Now, how is the voltage actually generated? Well, this negative terminal we'll just define as zero volts. So it's down here. When you get to this transition area between the acid and the electrode, it gets a little bit more positive. It's maybe uh, 0.3 volts in this one cell battery. Then the electrolyte has pretty much a constant voltage because its conductivity is extremely high. At the interface of the electrolyte and the positive terminal, you get a whole bunch more voltage. So you have zero volts over here and some positive voltage over here. As the cell decreases, both of these heights of this voltage gets slightly less. And eventually, when it's dead, these are, are very small. You're not left with much voltage. Now, what does this really have to do with what I'm talking about? Well, the reason that these concepts are important is because the only way that current can move from this electrode to this electrode, or vice versa, is to have chemical reactions happen inside this electrolyte. And that's really the basis of Pukert's law. These chemical reactions take time. There is charge accumulated over here, over here. The uh, distribution of these ions in the electrolyte moves around. And there are a lot of factors that affect this, how close these terminals are, how much sulfate is on both of these terminals, etc. The concentration of the acid, because when this acid is very strong, there's all kinds of ions floating around, and these reactions can happen very, very easily. When this acid is dilute, and these are covered with sulfate, covering up the active material, and specifically if the battery is cold, slowing down chemical reactions, these reactions don't happen very easily. Uh, in fact, they happen very slowly. You almost have to force them to happen. And the battery doesn't work very well in that case. But what's important here is that every time one of these reactions occurs, you end up with a couple of electrons. It steals two from here, it adds two to here. So it's very clear just conceptually that the capacity of this battery does not depend on how fast you discharge it. It does not depend on what temperature it is. What it depends on is how many ions are available. That's what really makes a battery capacity. <clears throat> if you have more lead to react, and you have more acid to react with, you end up with a higher capacity battery. And that's why, excluding some other factors that I won't go into here, uh, basically you can tell how much capacity a battery has by its weight, because it's the amount of lead and the amount of acid that you put into the battery. Certainly the acid concentration matters, the purity of the lead, how porous the lead plates are, etc., etc. Uh, if the in interconnects in, in these lead plates, because there's multiple batteries, right? There's another battery over here with another terminal in it. And uh, internally these two are then strapped together. This is a negative, that's a positive. And you make a big battery. That's why it's called a battery, because there's six cells in a 12 volt battery. This is just a single wet cell. It's debatable whether you can call a single cell a battery or not. Not part of this discussion. Over time, there is some parasitic redox reactions and such that occur, and very slowly over time this battery will self-discharge. But it takes on order of months for a battery to discharge. And that's not really part of this discussion because we're talking about discharging a battery in one hour versus 20 hours. And the self-discharge rate is entirely irrelevant for that. So, someone who is claiming that battery capacity depends on discharge rate or temperature has to explain where these ions go. Is it some parasitic reaction in the battery that's using them up? Or are they just disappearing, you know, coming out of the electrolyte surface and going away? There are some parasitics. For example, if you have a lead antimony battery in particular, their efficiency is lower than a lead calcium battery. And part of the reason for that is because they outgas. You have electrolysis at, uh, at the terminals here, and the battery acid actually splits into hydrogen and oxygen, and some of that escapes. And along with it, some of these ions go away also. And then you have to refill it with water again. And that is one way in which some of this charge in the battery can, quote, disappear. Uh, but it's a relatively small amount.
and it doesn't depend a whole lot on rate. <clears throat> to be exactly correct, I have to say that discharge rate has a very small effect on the capacity of your battery, as does temperature, because batteries will gas much quicker when it's hot. In fact, if it gets too hot, they can go into a runaway condition and destroy themselves. And also, if you discharge or recharge a battery very quickly, it outgasses more. Less of it gets a chance to recombine, um, and uh, it does lose some of that water. So discharge rate does have a small effect on the capacity of a battery, but for most practical purposes, it is negligible. So let's talk about battery efficiency, because that's really what this discussion is about. Normally people look at amp hours, but amp hours really is not very relevant. It's battery efficiency that matters.